Hi, I'm Michael O'Hayan. Hi, I'm Nusaniwal. And we'll be the host for today's podcast. Welcome back. So for those who don't know, the Scripps Ranch Professional Career Exploration Club is an organization dedicated to interviewing professionals from many different career paths. We aim to help students find a career that's right for them. And we have a very special guest today. Give a warm welcome to Jennifer Carberry. Dr. Carberry is an assistant research professor at Duke University Medical Center. Dr. Carberry received her bachelor's in biochemistry at Clemson and her PhD at John Hopkins. She has written 23 research papers. Dr. Carberry, welcome to the show. Thank you. So what are the steps needed to publish a research paper? Yeah, so it all starts with some sort of hypothesis or question that you want to answer. And then uh, the next step is to have some well-constructed experiments. So with the proper controls, and then once you get the results from those experiments, you need to make sure that they're also repeatable. Um, and then you write up your paper. peer review. And so that's where other scientists read the manuscript and give suggestions for changes and make sure that everything looks okay. And then usually after that process, there's changes that you need to make to your paper and then it gets published and then you have a big celebration. And I mean, just to clarify, it's not a short process. I mean, I I looked at the timelines for some of your papers and, uh, they're upwards of what, like five, 10 years? Right, it could be years for sure, yeah. yeah. How did you discover your career in teaching and research? Yeah, so in high school, I really loved science. Um, and so that got me thinking about graduate school. Um, and then once I was in college, I w- really thought that I was more interested in experiments than seeing patients. So often when people are interested in science, you know, the kind of the question is the medicine side of things or the science side of things. And so since I was more interested in the experiments instead of patients, then I went to get my PhD. Um, And then when I was in graduate school, I tried teaching and I found that I really loved it. So that's kind of one pointer I have is just if you have the chance to try something new, just go for it because that really can help you figure out what you want to do. And, you know, I try not to overthink things and just take advantage of um, things that come my way and not get too freaked out about whether I'll be able to do it or not. (laughs) Just try it and see how it goes and not worry about failure too much. So um, I really fell in love with teaching. So now um, for the last several years, I do primarily teaching and I do only a little bit of research in more education. Um, So I teach first year medical students for um, the bulk of my time. And um, that's one great thing about having a degree like a PhD or an MD um, or a bachelor's in engineering, or there's lots of degrees that can be super flexible. So you don't have just one career option. And so I'm able to teach with my PhD, which I love. And another thing I'll say about that is just, um, one reason why I chose teaching is because I really get a lot of satisfaction out of it because I'm directly helping people. Sorry, my dogs are wrestling behind me. I don't know if you can hear them. (laughs) So I um, get a lot of satisfaction out of teaching because I am directly helping people. Whereas in research, you know, it can, it's really difficult. And sometimes you don't see that connection to helping people. And so, um, again, when choosing a career path, thinking about what you want to get out of it, Um, is important because you're doing it every day and you've got to do something that really excites you and gets you out of bed. Um, And for me, that's feeling like I'm helping people. Um, And so that has made me enjoy my career. Yeah, two of the most important factors I'd say in finding a career is passion number one, which you already touched on, but also fit. So how do you, what kind of characteristics should a person have if they do want to go into research? Like who's, who's the right person for the job? Yeah, so you have to be super passionate about research, which I would say I probably wasn't. (laughs) 
<laughs> so because it's tough because a lot of times your experiments don't work it's amazing when they do but um it takes a lot of passion to keep trying and patience and creativity to kind of troubleshoot your experiments but if you you know the people that i know who love research there's nothing else they want rather do and that's really all that you need i think so to expand on like the toughness of research what do you think is the most challenging aspect of research yeah just the everyday um troubleshooting experiments and getting them to work um that that can be tough. Sometimes things go your way and sometimes it doesn't. So you have to just keep trying, be patient, get creative, and just not, don't give up. <laughs> um, on a little bit more of a personal aspect of that, um, a lot of your research is uh, very centered on aquaporins, which as I understand them are the water channels um, and cells. So can you explain why you chose you know, such a niche topic to research? Yeah, so when I was in graduate school, um, aquaporins had just been discovered a few years before. And so the lab that I went into had discovered them. And so it's really exciting time because um, they're in every organism. And so there were just so many open questions about um, what they did. And so that, um, made it really exciting. And then my mentor, Dr. Peter Augury, who discovered aquaporins was just a wonderful mentor as well. So that is another reason why I chose his lab. And then a few years, um, once I was in his lab, he won the Nobel Prize in chemistry. And so it's really cool to be in his lab when he won the Nobel Prize. Yeah, it was really cool. So I picked, I made a good choice. <laughs> So a lot of people don't um, take their college, um, they don't always try to get a PhD, they, like, they kind of end with masters. So who is the right type of student to pursue a PhD? Yeah, um, really anyone who again has that commitment and passion for science should pursue a PhD. Um, you know, and really science is trying and trying to continue to be more and more diverse. And so science wants everyone, um, you know, in graduate school, there, there are, um, it's a pretty even split in the biological sciences for males and females, but then higher and higher up in the professor ranks, there's fewer females and there's a lot of underrepresented groups that um, need more representation in science. So um, yeah, science right now is trying to, increase its diversity. And um, really, if you're kind of designing experiments and running a research program, then that's when you need the PhD. Yeah, PhD is just about as, you know, deep into a topic as you can possibly learn. Um, and, you know, especially when you're going to, you know, these incredibly challenging universities, or I guess research centers like Johns Hopkins, for example. Um, and, you know, what did you notice um, in terms of like academic rigor between your undergraduate studies and your postgraduate studies? Yeah, it's totally different. So college, <clears throat> the science courses are pretty similar to what you get in high school, but, you know, more in depth. But you're just learning about biology and chemistry. But in graduate school, um, you're really learning how to think. And so even the lectures we had in our courses, they would often be taught, um, like they'd tell us the scientific facts, like the structure of DNA, but then they'd also tell us the experiments that, that led to that knowledge. And so our, course, our coursework was just basically telling us about all of these historical experiments that happen. And then that's only a small part of getting the PhD. A lot of it is getting, um, doing the research, and that's where you're learning how to formulate a question and try to prove, you know, your hypothesis and make sure that um, all the controls for the experiment are done properly. And so you're really learning how to be a cr critical thinker, um, which is 
you know, useful in other parts of your life <laughs> as well. Yeah, in our uh, in our uh, AP Biology course, for example, we spent about half the chapter talking about those, you know, little studies. You know, we uh, it was the DNA chapter, so you know, we went through Hershey and Chase, we went through Shargaff, we went through Watson Crick. So, um, you know, those are the only studies we hear about, just because you know they were so profound and the impact they had was so profound on the scientific community. Um, but you know from what I hear from you, very few studies actually work, especially, you know, within a short time period. So how are you able to, you know, build up that resiliency to keep working on a topic, keep trying to prove a hypothesis, even yeah. with, you know, a time constraint of a lifetime? Yeah, and that's why, you know, the passion's necessary. And, you know, it's not, the experiments work often enough just to keep you going. <laughs> and there's so many, so much amazing stuff going on right now in science and in biology is just incredible like artificial intelligence and gene editing and um, cryo electron microscopy things that are just uh, mind-boggling some of the neuroscience and the manipulation of neurons in a living animal just really amazing stuff so it's super exciting um, and it, it keeps you going yeah, I remember hearing the saying that the farther up you go in your education, you don't necessarily know more, but you just know that you know less. So I think it's that, you know, intellectual curiosity and just, you know, kind of this questioning of the world around you that drives a lot of the people who are at your level of education. You're absolutely right. You're very right that the more you know, the more you realize how little we know and how much more there is to figure out. You're absolutely right. Um, so a lot of people think that curiosity might be the driving force, but I also believe that maybe the profoundness of how you might like how much how much the research might impact the society at a given moment, how might that help? So how does how does that contribute to uh, staying with the research? Yeah, no, and I think that's something that um, everyone needs to kind of figure out for themselves is how much does that matter to them? Some people are perfectly happy studying things just for the purpose of understanding them. But, you know, doing more medically relevant research can definitely help you um, feel like you're more directly helping people. Or, you know, you may be actually interacting with patients as a PhD as well. Through yeah, one of your uh, publications is actually talking about like the arsenic trioxide uptake through these aquaglyceroporin channels. And I think it's that relevancy that, I mean, that interests me personally. And I think that's also, you know, one of the driving forces for um, a lot of research. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we want to thank you a lot. Um, that this was such an incredible interview. Um, you shared a lot of really perceptive advice in your career. Um, we hope everyone learned as much as we did today. And a huge thank you to Dr. Carver for joining us. So uh, we are SRPCC, and we hope you enjoyed. Bye. Thank you. Bye, guys.